when it comes right down to it, there are basically two types of reactions that we normally deal with in nature. The first is acid-base reactions. These are the reactions in which protons are passed between chemical species. And the second type is the topic for today. These are called oxidation-reduction reactions, or redox reactions for short. In this type of reaction, it's not protons, but electrons that are exchanged between chemical species. Here's an example. Redox reactions are very common in nature. For example, all combustion reactions are of this type, so when you heat your home or drive down the road, it's redox reactions that are at work. And it's redox reactions that fuel your body and make it possible, for example, for me to explain these reactions to you at this very moment. Now that's a rather surreal observation when you think about it. Anyway, as I said, a simple example of redox reactions is shown in the screen right now. Let's look at it again. We have a metal atom, sodium, which you recall is an alkali metal and therefore has one valence electron. And we have an atom of the halogen chlorine with its seven valence electrons. By now you should feel fairly comfortable with the idea that to obey the octet rule, the sodium atom will give up its valence electron to the chlorine atom. And in redox terms, this represents a transfer of the electron from sodium to chlorine. Now, of course, you probably recognize that this scenario, as shown, isn't very realistic. Chlorine doesn't exist as single atoms in nature, but as dichlorine molecules. So if we were to write this reaction, it would look like this, with two sodium atoms each transferring one electron to a chlorine molecule to produce two separate chloride ions. The reaction as written is a balanced redox reaction. And as you can see, the transfer of electrons is hidden in the way the reaction is written, but understood by all chemistry initiates like yourself. In fact, when you look at a reaction like this, you might imagine the invisible electrons making their way from the one species to the other. The way we write the ionic product of the reaction, NaCl, conceals the fact that it really consists of separate sodium plus ions and Cl minus ions, which are the result of this electron transfer. One of the simple rules of redox reactions is that we can't have leftover electrons when the reaction is over. So it's important that we keep track of the electrons as they move around between reactants and products. This is relatively easy to do for a simple reaction like the one we saw on the previous slide. But what about a combustion reaction like this? Uh -huh. I guess the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is this really a redox reaction? Well, one clue that gives it away as a redox reaction is that it is clearly not an acid-base reaction. Neither this carbon species, called ethane, nor oxygen gas is an acid or a base. It turns out this is a redox reaction, and in a minute I'll show you how we know for sure. But to do that, I first have to introduce you to a simple system that chemists have devised to keep track of electrons in cases like this. This system involves assigning numbers called oxidation numbers, or commonly also called oxidation states, to each of the elements in a chemical species. So first, let's learn how to assign oxidation states, and then I'll show you that this is definitely a redox reaction. There are specific rules for assigning oxidation states to elements in chemical species. First rule. The oxidation state of an unreacted element is zero. For example, the oxidation state of sodium in the reaction shown is zero. And I bet you can't guess the oxidation state of chlorine. Yep, it's zero also. Notice that we make no distinction between the oxidation states of the two atoms in Cl2. They are both zero. Next rule. The oxidation state of a monatomic ion is the charge on the ion. 
So with that in mind, what is the oxidation state of sodium in sodium chloride? Well, the charge on the sodium ion is plus 1. So the oxidation state of sodium is plus 1. How about chlorine in sodium chloride? The charge on this ion is minus 1. So the oxidation state is minus 1. What could be easier? OK, let's go to the next rule. The sum of the oxidation states for all atoms in a species is the charge on that species. For example, in sodium chloride, notice that the overall charge on the compound is 0, and that the sum of the oxidation states of the sodium ion, plus 1, and the chloride ion, minus 1, is 0 also. So consider a species like carbon dioxide now. If I told you that the oxidation state of oxygen in carbon dioxide was minus 2, what would be the oxidation state of carbon? What would it have to be? Well, let's see. The overall charge on the species is 0. Each oxygen is minus 2, and there are two of them. So that adds up to minus 4. So the oxidation state of carbon must be plus 4 to make the total for the molecule 0. See how that works? Now let's try another, this time the nitrate ion. This time the total charge on the species now is minus 1. Again, if I tell you that the oxidation state of oxygen in this species is minus 2, then what must be the oxidation state of nitrogen? Well, three oxygens add up to minus 6. And when we add the value for nitrogen, the total has to be minus 1. So nitrogen must be plus 5. OK, those are some of the general rules. The rest of the rules deal with the typical oxidation states of a number of common elements. I'm just going to give you the two most common here, and you can get the rest from your book, your teacher, or maybe your fairy godmother. <laughs> here are the two most useful ones. Oxygen is typically minus 2, and hydrogen is typically plus 1. There are exceptions even to these values, and you can get those from your book. But more often than not, these are the values for oxygen and hydrogen. And since so many compounds contain oxygen and hydrogen, you'll be using these values a lot. I promised that once we had some rules for assigning oxidation states, I'd show you that this combustion reaction is really a redox reaction. It's time to keep my promise. To do that, there's one simple principle you need to understand. In order for the reaction to be the redox type, the oxidation states of at least two elements have to change. So an easy way to tell whether a reaction is redox or not is to assign oxidation states to all the elements in the reactants and products and see if any have changed value. So let's do it. To help in your learning, hit pause and try to do it by yourself. OK, now I'll give it a try. In the carbon-containing species called ethane, each hydrogen has an oxidation state of plus 1. There are six of them, so that totals plus 6. The charge on the species is 0, so the oxidation states of the carbons must add to minus 6. There are two carbons so each must have an oxidation state of minus 3. Now oxygen in O2 has an oxidation state of 0. It's an element, remember? Now in the products, let's look at the carbon dioxide. Each oxygen is minus 2. There are two of them. So the total is minus 4. That means that carbon must be plus 4, right? And in water, each hydrogen is plus 1 and the oxygen is minus 2. Now to the question, is this a redox reaction? Well, let me ask you. Have the oxidation states of any of the elements changed in going from reactants to products? Mm -hmm. Carbon has gone from minus 3 to plus 4, and oxygen has gone from 0 to minus 2. And that's the sure sign that this is a redox reaction. In fact, you can take it to the bank. If the oxidation states of any elements in the reaction have changed, it's a redox reaction. 
The penultimate item on our agenda for today is to introduce two new pairs of terms. The first pair is oxidized and reduced. When the oxidation state of an element goes up during the reaction, we say that the species that contains that element has been oxidized. And when the oxidation state of an element goes down during the reaction, we say that the species that contains that element has been reduced. Take the reaction we just talked about. In this reaction, carbon was oxidized. Its oxidation state went up. So the species that was oxidized is ethane, the one that contains carbon. And conversely, oxygen was reduced. So the species that was reduced was dioxygen. Got it? Mmm. And now for the other pair of terms. Oxidizing agent and reducing agent. This is where things get a little confusing. The oxidizing agent is the species that causes the other species to be oxidized. So if you think logically about it, the oxidizing agent can't be the species that is oxidized. Therefore, it must be the species that is reduced. Conversely, the reducing agent is the species that causes the other species to be reduced. Now, if you feel like your brain is being twisted into knots at this point, take heart. There's a simple mnemonic that will help immensely here. Here it is. The oxidizing agent is reduced, and the reducing agent is oxidized. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. What that means, in effect, is that if we can identify the species that's reduced, that will be the oxidizing agent. And if we can identify the species that's oxidized, that will be the reducing agent. Now, let's take a look at our example and see if we can pick out the oxidizing and reducing agents. It's easy. We already decided that dioxygen was reduced. Therefore, dioxygen is the oxidizing agent. Ethane was oxidized, so it's the reducing agent. Well, you've learned the mechanics of picking apart redox reactions. But what does it all mean? Remember that redox reactions involve the passing of electrons between species. So how does this relate to oxidation states and all this other stuff? Think of it this way. When the oxidation state of an element goes down, this represents the element picking up extra electrons we say it is reduced. So reduction, then, is the process of gaining electrons. Why use the word reduction? Well, at a certain level, this makes sense, because electrons have a negative charge. You and I might have defined it differently, but if we'd wanted to have a say in the matter, we should have been born much earlier. So when a species is reduced, that is, gains more electrons, it picks up more negative charge. And a reducing agent, then, must be the species that provides those electrons to the species that's being reduced. Of course, the oxidizing agent receives electrons from the reducing agent, resulting in less negative charge on the reducing agent, which, of course, is oxidized. Its oxidation state goes up as its net charge goes up. <coughs> So, I know this is a little confusing, but sleep on it, and hopefully tomorrow when you wake up it won't feel so bizarre. If it does, you might wish to consult your therapist. <laughs>